Welcome to everybody and uh, let's hope that the, the whole session flows really smoothly. We've got um, lots of exciting things to work through today. Uh, we might start off, if Kate's able to take the microphone, just to give you a little bit of a quick introduction to this uh, new platform that we're using, Adobe Connect, uh, just to show you some of the functionality and things like that. Okay, Kate? Everyone, sorry you heard all the background noise earlier. I still just relayed. I am stuck on the lounge. It's like my uh, deserted island, and I can't get off it. Um, so I just wanted to give you a quick orientation. To connect. Um, it's very similar to the tool we were using uh, last week, although it's a little bit uh, more functional. So what I'm going to do in a moment is, is um, one of the great things about this tool is visualize things. So I'm just going to make the chat bigger for you so you can see more of the chat and I'm just going to make that participant window a little bit smaller. So uh, now you've got quite a long chat there so you can see what's happening and chat in the chat box. Basically all you need to know about is uh, to make sure you can hear me. Um, then the other thing, things are very similar to the other tool, except here in Adobe Connect, the um, buttons are all at the top of the screen instead of the bottom of the screen. So I've tested with many of you, uh, and you know how to switch your mic on by clicking on the microphone button. So the other thing I'm going to show you at this point is where you can use emoticons and put your hand up. So the final icon, uh, round about in the center of the screen, is a little person with their hand up in the air. You can use that button uh, to click down on the down arrow and you can select raise hand, which will put your hand up and we'll know you want our attention. There's also other options there as well, like you can put up a smiley or that kind of thing. Okay, so that is in a nutshell how to use this tool. The most important thing is that you can hear us. Um, I'll pop a chat message in, in a moment just to confirm that everyone can. Actually, probably the easiest way to confirm is if you can hear me, can I get you to give me a, a smiley in the chat transcript? So you can just do that by typing a smiley in the chat, just like that. Um, so that's kind of how it is. It's a very simple tool. If you're using the iPad app, it's... Uh, the same setup as what's on the screen with a PC or um, a laptop, and it's all very simple to use. If you aren't using an iPad app tonight, um, I will let you know it's a really great experience on the iPad app, so you can use that in the future if you like. Nice to see a bit of variety in your smileys there, good stuff. Now, just one thing before we finish up. I um, am going to steal back your microphone privileges in a second. We have a number of guest speakers tonight, and to ensure that everyone has a good quality audio experience, I'm going to turn your microphones off um, so that you don't accidentally leave them on during the session, and so that I don't accidentally leave mine on again with all the background noise. So that's it. If you have any issues at all with Thank you very much indeed, Kate. Just one question. When, when our guest speakers do come in for the panel session, they'll just need a microphone. So uh, that's, I just give them that authority? Yes, I'll just make them host as I see them arrive. Okay, that's great. So, And we've got Suzanne here to start with. We'll sort of be later. There'll be five more coming through, as you've seen before. So that's great. Okay, okay. Great. right. Thank you for that. Hopefully everybody feels quite comfortable with Adobe Connect. And we won't get any gremlins creeping in anywhere at all. So let's get the show on the road. Um, in this session, it's a very full session and there's uh, lots to cover. Um, we've got a variety of things happening. Uh, to start with, we've got Suzanne Lewis. I'll introduce Suzanne in a moment. And she's going to talk to you about what clinicians do, so to take you into um, the life of um, a health librarian who's um, got to deal with or interact with clinicians, so the type of sort of understanding that you might need for that. Um, after Suzanne's finished her presentation, I'll give you a little bit of information to help you contextualize some of the information that you're going to be hearing throughout the program for the next eight weeks. Uh, we have another guest. She's actually uh, been able to make a video, so we might actually um, have to, depends on timing, how we manage that. But Melanie Kammerman has undertaken a census of Australian health libraries, so that gives you a lot of industry information 
about the whole sector. And that's really quite interesting as well. And then after a break, we'll have a quick break around the top of the hour. And then there's a panel session and we've got five panel members coming to join us who are going to introduce their lives as health science librarians, how they got into the industry and what is really important to them. And then there'll be time for questions at the very end as well. So that's the, the scope of the night and hopefully that will all go really well. Just getting some papers there. Right, so let's move on straight away and we haven't got video unfortunately on this one but here's uh, Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne is a library manager with Central Coast Local Health District based in Gosford in New South Wales. And just to read her a little bit of an introduction, uh, she's worked in health librarianship since 1998 and her interests include very much around professional development for health librarians, evidence-based librarianship and evidence-based practice. So not only has she contributed papers and evidence summaries to the online journal Evidence-Based Library and Information Practice, which I encourage you to take a look at, uh, she's a member of the Editorial Advisory Board. She is importantly a co-convener of the Australian Evidence-Based Practice Librarians Institute, which runs annual three-day residential workshops and is certainly an, an onward and upward professional development opportunity after this program to learn a lot more. And since 2010, she's been a member of the ALIA Health Libraries Australia HLA Executive Committee. Um, and of course, they are integral partners with us for, for this whole program. And so, without further ado, I'd like to hand the microphone over to Suzanne. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you very much, Jill. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. I can certainly hear. Oh. And everybody yes. else can too. Good. Okay. okay, so it's all yours. All yours. Thank you very much. Okay, well, um, welcome everyone uh, to this course, Health Librarianship Essentials. Um, I'm really pleased to be uh, participating in it again this year. Uh, so th this evening, um, my presentation uh, is about what clinicians do. And uh, as you probably gathered from Jill's introduction, uh, I work in a hospital library. So I have a very uh, clinical focus, um, which is a bit different from, uh, say, health librarians who work in an academic setting. I deal with um, clinicians. Uh, all the time. And so what, one of the main things that clinicians do, uh, obviously, is treat illness or injury. And by clinicians, I mean not only doctors, but also nurses, physiotherapists, speech pathologists, psychologists, and so on and so forth. So the whole range of health professionals who are engaged in providing patient care. Of course, clinicians do other things besides treating illness. And for many of them, these other things are their main occupation. So for example, research, health promotion, and so on. But for this presentation, we're going to concentrate on the process followed by uh, many clinicians when they see a patient. Uh, because for all the possible variations in the role of the clinician and the setting in which the patient is seen, the process remains essentially the same. And this process also forms the basis of how health professionals are educated, uh, how medical, nursing and allied health students learn their professions. So um, if anybody has any questions or comments as we go along, uh, please um, put them in the chat and um, Jill and Cecily will be monitoring that. Okay, so last week you were introduced to an online medical terminology course uh, hosted by Des Moines University in the United States. And this is an excellent introduction to medical terminology. And if you're new to a health library, uh, or even if you're just for interest, uh, I suggest that you um, dip into it and um, you know perhaps work through some of the modules at your own pace, even after you finish this course. 
and you'll be provided with an overview of the terminology associated with each of the body's main systems, so the circulatory system, the digestive system and so on and so forth, uh, plus terminology regarding cancer and medications. And that's one way of approaching the language of health uh, via the, the systems approach. But in my presentation tonight, we'll consider the terminology uh, around the natural history of illness and the clinical process uh, using the example of measles. So the natural history of an illness is best described as the course that an illness takes without any kind of intervention or treatment. And the clinical process is the pathway followed by clinicians as they intervene in the natural history of an illness at various key stages. And it's important for health librarians to be aware of these stages as we're often asked by clinicians to provide information at some of the stages. And many of the information resources we manage, uh, particularly the resources that are designed to be used at the point of care, are structured according to these key stages. So just um, a little bit about measles. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with measles. Many people uh, used to have it uh, as children. It's an acute infectious disease, usually of childhood, uh, caused by a virus. It's characterised by fever, rash, cough and sore eyes. Most people start feeling better about two days after the rash starts. After three or four days, the rash starts to turn brown and go away. Many people have a cough for one or two weeks after the rash. About 0.1% of, of people who get measles experience a severe complication uh, called encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, and about 0.3% of people die from the disease. And it can cause miscarriage in pregnant women if they're infected. And in Australia, the combined measles, mumps and rubella vaccine is on the immunisation schedule uh, with the first dose given at 12 months of age. And this is just a screenshot from the um, New South Wales Health Department website from last year um, alerting people to uh, measles. So the first stage of the clinical process uh, is around um, something called epidemiology. So even before a clinician considers the patient in front of them, they'll have a background knowledge of the epidemiology of diseases or conditions. And this includes things like how often new cases appear, whether there is any seasonal variation, uh, so with measles, the numbers of cases tends to be higher in spring. Uh, which groups of people are likely to be affected? So uh, it's children in the case of measles. So in other words, epidemiology is concerned with how a disease behaves at the population level uh, rather than the individual level. And it's helpful for clinicians to be aware of the epidemiology of diseases. Uh, as this is one of the many pieces of information that aids in an accurate diagnosis. So a GP uh, in their surgery um, seeing perhaps the, you know, uh, a couple of children come in in, in, in one session with um, the classic measles rash uh, would probably already be aware that uh, measles was about and that would then aid them in a possible diagnosis of, of the children uh, that they're seeing. And um, health librarians are, are uh, sometimes asked to find information, uh, epidemiological data uh, for clinicians. And this kind of information is often found in databases such as the Australian Bureau of Statistics Products and government websites such as the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and uh, in my state the New South Wales Health Department's weekly communicable diseases report. Okay, so following on from epidemiology, uh, the next um, 
stage in the clinical process uh, is um, etiology or uh, causation. So yes, etiology is really just a fancy word for causation. In the case of measles, it's caused by a virus and it's caught very easily. It's spread via infectious droplets from the respiratory tract of an infected person. In other words, it spreads through air, particularly in crowded spaces such as schools. Person-to-person uh, -person contact is not required. And this is why in Australia, measles is a notifiable disease and contacts of the person with measles are followed up uh, as they can easily catch the disease as well. So uh, when the clinician is considering uh, etiology, um, this is the kind of a question that a clinician might ask a health librarian to research. Uh, so in this case the question is, does the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine cause autism in children? And this is something that um, has been floating around uh, in the news for quite a few years now. It's a question that GPs may encounter when they're recommending childhood vaccination. It's an emotive topic and it can cause parents great concern. In the first instance, uh, a health librarian uh, who was trying to find some evidence uh, to answer this question would probably search one or more of the main biomedical databases such as Medline, Embase or Cochrane for a well-designed research article or a systematic review examining a possible association between childhood immunisation with the MMR vaccine and the development of autism. And uh, you'll be looking at a um, number of these resources in depth in Module 2 of this course. Uh, for the record, a number of studies and systematic reviews have been done on this topic and have found no association between childhood immunisation and autism. Okay, so having considered um, causation or etiology, uh, the clinician will also consider how the causative agent, uh, in the case of measles, this is a virus, affects the body at the level of cells, organs and tissues. So for example, uh, the measles virus stimulates the body to produce antibodies which can be measured in the blood of a patient. Uh, and if a definitive diagnosis is required for measles, um, it needs to be a blood test. So um, these, this area of uh, pathogenesis uh, pathology, physiology, anatomy, um, they're all areas of clinical knowledge that usually don't change very quickly. So the best place to start looking for this kind of information is often medical textbooks including um, atlases. So if a clinician came to the library with a question um, such as uh, what pathological and physiological changes would be expected in the cerebrospinal fluid of a patient with encephalitis developed as a complication of measles infection, uh, you would probably um, first consult some uh, textbooks uh, and maybe some point of care resources uh, such as up to date and uh, maybe some online image libraries for medical illustrations. Uh, health librarians are often asked by clinicians for images for teaching purposes. Uh, many of the subscribed resources which are available to health libraries uh, which you'll be looking at uh, next week also contain images and uh, as always you'd have to check the copyright provisions for the use of those images. Okay, so the next stage uh, in the clinical process is um, looking at uh, the clinical features of the illness uh, as it's manifest um, in the patient. 
and much of the of the actual clinical encounter between a patient and a health professional consists of the identification of the clinical features of an illness. So for example, a general practitioner faced with a patient uh, he or she suspects has measles will do the following. First, they'll take a detailed history from the patient, asking them questions about when they first began to feel unwell, how their illness progressed, whether they've been in contact with anyone with measles, and whether they're immunised against measles. So this stage, uh, taking a history, focuses on the patient's symptoms, that is what they are feeling and experiencing. Secondly, the GP will do a physical examination looking for signs of illness. Uh, for example, they'll take the patient's temperature to see if they have a fever. They'll examine the patient's skin to see if they have a rash and if so, what it looks like. And they may progress uh, to ordering some diagnostic tests uh, such as x-rays or in the case of measles, this would be um, a blood test. The next stage, having gathered all that information uh, from the history and the clinical examination, um, is to make a diagnosis. So at this point, the clinician may be in a position to make a firm diagnosis. In other words, to identify and name what's wrong with the patient. Or they may still have several diagnostic possibilities known as a differential diagnosis. And in this case, further examination or tests may be required. Sensitivity and specificity are important concepts at the diagnosis stage of the process. Sensitivity describes how good a test is at picking up all the true cases of a disease. And specificity describes how good a test is at ruling out all the false cases of a disease. And the ideal test has high sensitivity and high specificity and is non-invasive and quick and cheap. Um, and such a test, as you can imagine, is uh, quite hard to find. So for this stage of the clinical process, um, health librarians might be asked for information about diagnostic tests, uh, particularly studies which compare tests to see which one is more accurate in correctly diagnosing a disease or a condition. So the question on this slide uh, illustrates such a question. How accurate is palpation or touch compared to thermometer in diagnosing fever in children? In other words, is uh, palpation or touch good enough to make, on which to make a diagnosis? Um, or do you need a thermometer test as well? For this kind of question, the health librarian would again turn to the major biomedical databases such as Medline. And for information about differential diagnoses, clinicians often consult one of the point of care resources directly. Um, and these are resources such as UpToDate or BMJ Best Practice. So treatment, therapy or management are all terms for what happens next. What the clinician does to change the course of the disease, to control symptoms, uh, and to aid the recovery of the patient. The most well-recognised form of treatment is drug treatment, but there are many other forms of therapy, including physical therapy, diet therapy, and so on. In the case of measles, uh, there is no cure as such for measles. The treatment is mainly for control of symptoms, to reduce fever, and uh, prevent dehydration. Um, vitamin A and an antiviral drug called ribavirin have also been used, but um, they're not used routinely. So 
So clinical questions about therapy or interventions or management are probably the most common questions that health librarians are asked to find information on. During the reference interview with the clinician, librarians often find it helpful to reframe a therapy question using this acronym uh, PICO. Uh, PICO uh, stands for, the P stands for the patient or the population being studied. The intervention, the I stands for the intervention or the treatment of interest. The C stands for the control or the comparison treatment, which can be usual care or a placebo or even no treatment at all. And the O stands for um, the outcome or outcomes of interest. Uh, and you will uh, revisit PICO in more detail in Module 2. The um, example here relates to the question of whether zinc supplementation reduces measles-related morbidity and mortality in children in, in developing countries who may be zinc deficient uh, because zinc plays a role in maintaining normal function of the immune system. And on the slide you can see how you might break that uh, question down into uh, the elements of the PICO acronym. So the patient or population would be children in developing countries with measles infection. The intervention would be zinc supplementation. The control would be no supplementation or maybe a placebo. And the outcome would be reduced measles related morbidity and mortality. And the best resources to answer therapy questions <coughs> are often research articles that are indexed in the major databases. So for this question you would probably start with the Cochrane Library to see if you could find a systematic review and then look at Medline and Embase uh, and possibly CINAHL, the Nursing and Allied Health database. Okay, so um, at this point in the clinical process, the clinician has um, examined the patient, taken a history, arrived at a diagnosis and um, instigated some treatment. The next stage to consider is the prognosis. In other words, what to expect. So the prognosis refers to the likely outcomes of the disease or the condition. And this is something that patients often ask about with questions such as, when will I be able to go back to work? Or in the case of a, a, a serious life-threatening disease, how long do I have to live? So clinicians need to know the potential complications, uh, also known as sequelae, uh, which is that's just a fancy word for complications, uh, of diseases and how likely the patient is to experience these. Uh, whether the patient is likely to make a full recovery, a partial recovery, or be facing living with a chronic illness for the long term. Or whether it's likely the disease will e even end in the death of the patient. Uh, if we return to our example of measles, uh, a clinician would need to know how likely it is that a child suffering from measles would go on to develop encephalitis. Uh, they would also need to know whether the likelihood varies depending on the age of the child and the mortality rate or the death rate for measles related encephalitis. And the epidemiological information resources we discussed earlier would provide the answers to these questions plus the health librarian may be asked to search for research articles as well in the biomedical databases. Okay, um, of course uh, prevention is better than cure. It's much better for the patient not to experience the disease in the first place. So health professionals regard prevention advice and strategies as part of the clinical process just as much as diagnosis and treatment. Immunisation is the best way 
to avoid catching many infectious diseases such as measles and Australia has a strong immunisation program. For other diseases, health professionals can intervene even after the patient starts showing signs of a disease to either slow the progress of the disease or even to reverse it. Uh, so for example, patients who show early signs of type 2 diabetes, um, for them it's possible to prevent progress to full diabetes through changes to diet and exercise. And other important disease prevention strategies including uh, stopping smoking, reducing alcohol consumption, practicing safe sex, uh, slip slop slap to reduce sun exposure and so on. And I'm sure we're, we're all familiar with many of those. And a clinician treating a child with, meas with measles uh, would encourage the parents to ensure that the whole family's immunisation schedule is up to date. A public health physician or a health promotion officer would be interested in prevention at the population level as well as needing to know rates of immunisation in their local area. So they might ask the health librarian to search for any studies on the effectiveness of various strategies to increase immunisation rates. So the clinical question on your screen, what's the best way to increase the immunisation rate for measles in children starting preschool in Brisbane is an example of that kind of question. Now these kinds of searches tend to be quite broad and they include the biomedical databases but also grey literature such as reports, conference proceedings and so on and country specific databases such as the informant health databases that are specific to Australia. Okay, so as I said at the start of this presentation, uh, it's important for health librarians to be aware of the clinical process because we're often asked by clinicians to provide information at some of these stages, particularly diagnosis, treatment and prognosis. Many of the information resources we manage, uh, particularly the resources designed to be used at the point of care, are structured according to these key stages. And you will learn uh, some more about these resources as you progress through the course. Uh, but if you have access to any of them at the moment, um, it's worth having a look at them. And some of the commonly used point of care information resources are things like BMJ Best Practice, UpToDate, Dynamed and Clinical Key. And finally, uh, by being aware of some of the terminology associated with the clinical process, you will be more confident in working with clinicians uh, to meet their information needs. So that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, if, are there it, any questions at this stage? Yes, thank you Suzanne. Um, any questions? that people have got, just drop them into the uh, chat box if you've got any queries. There was a lot to take in, I understand that, and a lot of new language um, and obviously you probably got to get your head around that. Any? No. Well don't forget That's that... Fine. Um... Yep, go on. Oh uh, yes, that's fine, Jill. As you said, there's a there's a lot of content in there, um, and uh, you know, it's it, for people who are not working in health, uh, mm. it, it has its own language. Uh, so that was really just an overview to introduce it to you. Um, but just drop in questions later on, or um, or on the the Facebook uh, site as well. Right. Yes, that's what I was going to suggest as well. So um, you can take some time after the class maybe to even listen to the recording and listen to it again so that you can, uh, having heard the whole presentation, just dip into the areas that you wanted to try and understand a little bit more deeply. Um, and certainly Suzanne is hovering around Facebook at different times. So uh, if you do have specific queries, she'd be only too happy to help you with that. Um, 
Part of the, the goal is obviously to, it depends what you are planning for the first uh, learning activity, the first assignment where you do go and interview a health librarian, but you might find that some of the information that's presented here uh, gives you a bit of an opportunity to open the conversation in some way as well. So um, that's great. But thank you, Suzanne. Uh, I always enjoy listening to that, even though I've heard it before. Uh, it's it's really good and it, it triggers lots of thoughts around your one's own health practice um, and how you sort of interact with your own GP at times as well. So, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So, Suzanne and Cecilia typing, that's great. That's all good. Okay, well, let's move on. Um, to make sure that we make the most of the time that we have available. Uh, my little slot here is around the HLA, Health Libraries Australia, and the environmental scan um, that was undertaken, admittedly, a few years ago now. Uh, this course really has emanated from the research work that was undertaken by Alia's group, the, the Health Libraries Australia. And so there's a report I just refer you to the Blackboard site. A lot of the resources that I'll just touch on here, there's no in-depth um, analysis or anything like that. There's almost too much to, to even get your head around. Um, all of the materials that we refer to here are included on the week one Blackboard site uh, under readings. So you can explore all of those in a little bit more detail. So in terms of the, the report that came out in 2011, Health Librarianship, Workforce and Education, Research to Plan the Future. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about that as, as we go. The team, sorry, I should actually do that. It's easier. Uh, the, the research team, you'll recognize some names here already. Suzanne, who you just heard speak. Cheryl, who's going to lead you through the activities in module two. Uh, some colleagues in Perth, who uh, Carol's now retired, Catherine has now, uh, should have updated that, she's now a university librarian at um, Curtin University. Patrick O'Connor will be joining us in a later session as well, and Melanie, her name we've mentioned in terms of the censor that has happened, and Anne Ritchie, Anne is with us this evening as well, and she's going to be one of our guest speakers next week, and of course myself here. So uh, the work that we did together um, has fed into the opportunity to collaboratively build this course and offer it to you. Uh, what we did very quickly um, was undertake a major environmental scan and literature review and then undertake some uh, research through some online surveys. We looked at the views of uh, individual health librarians and there were 162 responses there that we considered. And then health library managers, there were 51 there. And then after that, a series of semi-structured interviews. What we were looking for, the data that we collected, was around the uh, demographics of the workforce, the health library workforce. So did get an in-depth uh, picture of what was happening there. Specifically looking as well at career aspects. So um, approaches to self-development, uh, the current and future roles and responsibilities of people working in the sector. And then a little bit more about what sort of programs people like, uh, what they get value from in terms of their own skills development, and whether there might be any barriers or opportunities there. And so it came up very strongly that an uh, online education was an important aspect for the future and that there was a need for some strong foundation programs for emerging health librarians. And so it doesn't take a quantum leap to, for you to understand that that sort of has led to this program being developed. So uh, the people who were involved in all of the research, uh, a lot of practitioners, our, our research team, was uh, the people that I've just introduced, obviously, as well. Uh, interesting on that point, just on a tangent, next Thursday at lunchtime across Australia, there's um, a really good panel discussion happening under one of the ARC grants into um, library and information science research. 
Um, I'm facilitating that as it happens, but we're going to be having a, a fantastic panel of people talking about practitioner research. You'll all be familiar with uh, academic research and what happens in the PhD space and things like that. Uh, but there's also a push for practitioner research. And this, uh, the, the, the activity that we undertook together is a real good example of practitioner research. So if this is an area of interest to you, as I say, a quick plug for lunchtime next week. Um, and there's uh, information on the e-list and things like that about that. But anyway, beyond that, um, obviously, as educators, uh, we were involved. Uh, Alia itself um, was involved. And I'll point you to a lot more research that HLA has undertaken with Alia's support as well. And then we looked at the employer perspectives, uh, how they perceive their library staff, and then some other multidisciplinary areas. So it was very rich in terms of what we covered. So in terms of the environmental scan, and uh, the aspects that we considered here were the actual national health workforce planning trends. So at that time in 2011, there was a lot happening around the national health workforce, ta workforce task force. That's quite a mouthful. Um, looking at national registration, coordinated clinical education, etc. Uh, looking at health informatics as what was the relationship between health librarianship and health informatics. So Health Workforce Australia was undertaking a lot of um, research in that area. However, due to funding situations, it was actually dissolved a couple of years ago. Uh, but the, the work that they did was still pretty valuable. In the UK, there's been some similar activities happening as well, and they've had a, a body of work happening under the Public Health Knowledge and Intelligence Workforce. So here again, thinking about public health, health knowledge and, and in public health intelligence, it's that information space again, which obviously health librarians occupy. Um, it also intersects into health informatics again, and also health statistics. So a report was re uh, published last year, so in May, uh, and that's a link to that on, uh, on the Blackboard site. But it looks specifically at the areas where workforce planning will be required to look at future needs. How is the workforce going to be sustainable? How we will ensure that everybody has the right skills and competencies to carry it forward into the future. So the report itself looks at, again, within the UK, the policy context. It gives some demographic information about the workforce, the different career pathways, education and training, etc. So I encourage you to, obviously, you know, while it's a UK study, there are parallels in terms of the workforce in Australia compared to the workforce in the UK as well. So it might give you some insights about uh, some of the challenges, some of the opportunities around that. Uh, thank you, Kate. I can just see you've put, uh, put the URL there for the panel session. Thank you. Uh, back to the environmental scan. It also looked specifically at health and hospitals reform. A lot of work has been happening in this um, area and continues in, in Australia. Uh, if you keep up to date just through the news, uh, newspapers, uh, different activities there, you'd probably be aware that there's widespread pressure on funding for health. It's Everybody is talking about um, population growth, uh, the ageing of the population and the implications of all of these on the costs of running a national health care programme and what the implications are going to be. So there's reviews, for example, the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, medical benefit scheme. Uh, very topical at the moment is should the GST be raised in some areas? What about Medicare levies? Um, so as a health librarian, it's really important that you understand the bigger picture, the policy issues which relate to um, health care that you're going to be involved in directly in your work. Uh, in terms of policy reform, um, GST, as you'd be aware, is very much around the uh, interactions between the Commonwealth Government and the states, uh, our federation of states. And there's a, a Reform of Federation discussion paper, or a white paper, which is discussing all of these issues in greater depth as well. 
they closed for submissions very recently, but obviously they're uh, reviewing and, and bringing together the key ideas that are being presented there. So there'll be more happening there as well. Um, and Richie has just commented there in the chat, you can see that very topical is federal funding versus state funding of hospitals. A couple of years ago, there was a lot of debate and it's probably still happening around federal funding of education as opposed to state funding. So again, these are critical issues that you do need to understand in terms of the sector that you won't be working, working in. Uh, there's an Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. There's um, a critical eye being cast uh, across uh, the importance of good quality, high quality care. Uh, near enough is not good enough in many health situations, of course. So there's been a push to have national standards and accreditation. So this commission actually sets the safety and quality in healthcare standards. Uh, that accreditation commenced a couple of years ago, January 2013, and it impacts on many areas, hospitals, clinical care, mental health, dental care, all of those. So those are very um, sort of important aspects. If you're working in a hospital library, it's quite uh, likely that you're going to be um, contributing information and knowledge to support the application for accreditation and things. So again, it's an area that you need to become familiar with. It's not just about all the clinical type of activities that Suzanne was talking about. It's much broader in terms of what you need to be on top of. This is an interesting um, area of that safety and quality website. They have put together an atlas which looks at the differences, the variations across healthcare standards, healthcare quality across the country. Um, this covers lots of different areas. Suzanne referred to diagnostic services, for example. You might find that in one state there's oversupply of diagnostics in some sort of area compared to other areas. Obviously, rural and regional areas of Australia would have quite different density of um, healthcare opportunities compared to uh, capital cities. So it's worth having a look for you to just develop your own understanding of what's happening across the states and across the country in terms of healthcare provision. And of course, importantly as well, there's an increasing, and I think some of this is through access to information, but consumer viewpoints, the actual understanding of the patient into all of those things that um, Suzanne was talking about in terms of diagnosis and therapies and prevention, the consumer wants to know what position is best for them. So there's a, a real push to get um, different aspects of healthcare understood from the, the cons through the consumer lens. So this screen here shows you a, a screenshot from myhospitals.gov.au. And it's um, providing richer data about the different hospital services, uh, individualizing the hospital services and giving you the opportunity to compare, as it shows on the thing there. Uh, it talks about the different indicators. How do they measure? How do they actually rank or benchmark uh, hospitals against each other? So that's, again, uh, very much from the individual consumer perspective or lobby groups, etc., etc., to find out what is available in that area. Suzanne has mentioned there that the second accreditation standard is particularly about consumer engagement in healthcare. So this is a new area for health librarians as well to be um, considering to what extent are they working directly in supporting clinicians, but then also the, uh, the healthcare. And there's again, so going on a bit of a tangent, there's been some good research undertaken um, in the library sector uh, through um, research grants again to look at understanding how consumers, how individuals do access health information. So um, it's it's a very yeah broad area that is changing constantly. Then also then the uh, the e health strategy. If you remember with the first rollout of um, plans around the NBN, they came out with quite a number of uh, areas of society which would benefit from 
uh, better access to information through online information. And there was education was a big one that you could be, have more online ed education, just as we're doing now. But also one of the uh, prongs, one of the, the um, pillars within that was e-health and that the internet was going to change the way that we understand the delivery of healthcare in this country. Part of that was the idea of having some centralised electronic health records. Uh, that's been contentious. Um, if you sort of did a bit of a history across it, the quote that in the middle there around the Mexican standoff between the politics and the clinical needs, the technical capabilities and, dare I say, the patient needs as well, um, that was quite problematic. So it was overhauled the what was called the PCAHR, the personally controlled e-health record system. That got overhauled and a new version of it was introduced, which is called My Health Record. And there's a website there that you can visit. Uh, there's an uh, issues paper. Uh, Cecily has done a lot of the background work to pull the updates of all of this together, so which is fantastic. Thank you, Cecily. But um, an issues paper around literally the issues, of course, relating to health records, electronic health records. Uh, that's sort of cited there as well. You can refer to that and find out more about it. And dare I say, this isn't only an issue for health librarians. Obviously, you need to understand it from that professional perspective. But there's um, a deep personal need to understand what is happening and where your views might fit into all of that as well. Many of you will have heard of the National Health and Medical Research Council, or NHMRC. Uh, they are doing some work in the area of clinical practice guidelines. And this again will be a topic that we're going to cover in the course, looking at the contribution that some librarians make towards the development of clinical practice guidelines. Again, as background for you to start reading around this, there's a discussion paper to understand um, where the clinical guidelines fit into the healthcare environment. And I think to build on what Suzanne has been saying, it's those, uh, the discussion paper is a good introduction to, to clinical practice to help you expand your understanding of the very brief introduction that she's provided. It also has got uh, information on the website around how guidelines are developed. And I think that might be quite, quite helpful for you to consider as well. Where does Alia fit into all of this as well? Um, and Health Libraries Inc, which is a, a, um, a, a body of, of a sort of advocacy group in Victoria. And some of you are in Victoria and will understand what's happening there as well. But there's been a couple of good studies which really look at the value of health library and information services. So the two that are here um, on the Health Libraries Inc. website, Questions of Life and Death, and that's an investigation into the value of health library and information services. That's dating back to 2012. Uh, Alia has been involved through HLA as well in an advocacy campaign around the return on investment that health libraries achieve. Um, Anne has been a, Anne Ritchie, who's with us, is a big um, player in that study as well. Uh, it, very importantly, that it takes the, I suppose, the perspective of for every dollar that's invested in a health library, what's the actual return on investment? Uh, so the report there will give you some really deep insights into how that was measured and the advocacy, the importance of advocacy for the sector to ensure that uh, there's a strong, sustainable future um, and that there is meaningful information that is part of the discussion, part of the conversation that's had with hospital management, with um, the healthcare managers as well, that access to information is, is really, really critical. Anne has just uh, quoted there at the very bottom in the chat view, um, $9 return on investment. So for every dollar that's investment, it was calculated that there was a $9 return on investment. So that's really important to consider how the impact is, is being received. What is the, uh, the impact on uh, patient care, on accreditation for the hospital, for example? Lots of different areas that can be measured and should be measured. So questions of life and death, 
uh, that looked specifically at um, the value and impact of health libraries. So I, I point you to that, I'm aware of the time, but it does highlight, as it shows there, the second point there, the contribution through service delivery, through the library collections, both physical and electronic, the whole technology aspects of um, access to information, the space and, the, and especially the staff. And again, it's the skills and talents of the staff that they bring to ensuring that uh, there is value and impact. Yeah, that didn't move. Okay, and there again, that's the bit more detail that Anne referred to there, that uh, there is major impact. I'll skip along because I know it's coming up to seven o'clock, so we need to take a very quick break as well. Uh, emerging, again, I'll just point you to all of the literature, the references are there on the Blackboard site, and these are the things that we will explore in more detail as we go through the different sessions as well. But I encourage you to think um, more broadly about what it is to be a librarian, to look at the different areas of emerging practice um, and how that will impact on professional practice into the future. And there are some suggestions or some ideas that are presented there, uh, very much around uh, the impact of or well, the focus on, on research is critical. So like academic libraries are really moving into that research support area very strongly. Equally well, uh, hospitals, uh, healthcare are in that, that same space for health research as well. So the research support, scholarly communication, impact of research, bibliometric services, etc. they're all um, really important. So again, we've covered this, I think, in terms of the clinical librarianship, but the different areas that uh, are important. And again, that's just a taster. You'll discuss a lot of this as we go through the program. And I'll just skip over, but Anne's uh, has spoken very loud and clearly around the, the necessity for librarians to understand the mission critical goals of the health provider who is employing the librarians as well to ensure that the work that the library undertakes is directly aligned and contributes to the healthy achievement of its own goals. Um, and if you can have those conversations, that really does contribute to a very strong future for, for libraries. Um, Cecily has highlighted some of the uh, interesting things that's been happening in the Health Information and Libraries Journal over a period of time, over the last four or five years. Um, Jeanette Murphy, who's a Senior Research Fellow at University College London, has been tracking different trends that are affecting health libraries across different countries of the world. And that makes for a very, very interesting read. Uh, very helpfully, I'll oh, just quickly go through theirs, um, the top trends being the importance of building partnerships, so you're not working in isolation, and that's within the sector for partnerships, but also with other agencies across the sector as well. Inevitably, the shift from print to digital, digital collections is impacting on things. Uh, money, financial constraints, um, is uh, producing challenges. Uh, that need to be dealt with in a, in a productive way. Uh, very much then the education and training role, contributing to skills development for people within the, the health sector as a whole. And in line with that, the, in, the very critical importance of professional development. On the Blackboard site, there are two summary articles which are very helpful, which draw together. So instead of having to read all 15 articles, you can get um, a real quick understanding about where the, the future is going, the trends that you need to understand. And so really, it's a very dynamic area that um, you need to get your head around. Um, and that's, I think, some of these ideas might be quite helpful for you in structuring your interview, formatting your interview, thinking about uh, what you might like to talk to your health librarian about um, along the way. So plenty of background reading. I say go to learning resources, module one, week one, and then it's under, under read. Um, there might be special things happening in your state, uh, some advocacy activities happening or something. So don't forget to share anything that you discover that might be of importance. 
And that was took us literally to seven o'clock, which is the game plan, which is very good. Any questions or comments? That was really fast and even faster than Suzanne's session. She speaks much more slowly than I do, so it's much more paced, I think. Um, but there's lots to read. And as I say, you can start with the environmental scan that uh, is in just sort of one chapter of the HLA report, but it's been updated. And uh, that's part of the value of this program is that every, every time we run it, we can then um, bring to light the latest trends, latest developments in those areas. Okay. So probably the best bet now is to let you get some headspace. Um, take a break for, shall we say, um, five minutes, if that's all right, so that we can make the most of our time with the panel. Um, Kate pointed out to you, I think, that uh, there's a step away button at the top under the little man with the hand or the little person with the hand. So you can step away and then come back in again. So it's uh, sort of about uh, five minutes or so. So seven, seven minutes past seven or something like that. And we'll see you back in the room then. So go and have a stretch, a glass of water, coffee, whatever you need. And we'll see you back again soon. Thank you. Hi, I'm just welcoming some of our hosts, oh, sorry, some of our panel members at the moment. I can see everybody's there, so um, I have made you all hosts, so that you should all have um, at the top of the screen the grey bar with a microphone. So 
So hopefully that's right. Everyone's just having, I should take my sign off. There's just a little bit of a break at the moment um, and we'll be starting in a couple of minutes time. So um, hopefully that's all right. But if you want to just say hello and check your microphones, that's also fine while we're, we've got those few moments. Hello. Yes, hello. That's Blair. Hello, Blair. Hello. That's all. Yes, and who is... Hello. hello. Mary. Yes, do you want to just... Mary. Hi, Mary. Good to have you with us. Thank you very much. Rachel, you're there as well? Yes, I'm here. Great. And your headsets are working all right? <laughs> yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you can hear you very well. And Nikki's there as well? Have you got microphone, Nikki? Heavy breathing. Nikki, are you all right with the microphone? I'll just jump across. Stephen, are you all right? You've got microphone control as well. Uh, yep, can you hear me? Yes, that's right. Yes, you're clear too. Thank you very much. Good. So just Nikki, I'm a little bit concerned about. And somebody's breathing quite heavily. If yeah, so just take care. All right. So, Nikki, if can you hear us? I wonder. Um, hopefully. Typing. Okay. Can you speak? All right, if you, can you see the microphone button at the top? Otherwise, there's also the, um, I mean, Kate can talk you through that. Just whether I had a conflict between two microphones earlier, so you can, you're speaking, but we can't hear you, so there's a problem. Um, if you go to the, can you see the meeting button? Your mic isn't turned on, Nikki. Okay, all right. So that's a good, yeah. Just to reiterate, can you see on the top bar, it says, you should be able to see meeting layouts, pods, audio, then a speaker signal button, and then a microphone button. You need to make that go live. You need to toggle the microphone on. Can you do that? Yes. Is it now? That Can you hear me now? All yes. Right. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Oh, what a relief. <laughs> got you there. <laughs> That's great. So just as a little bit of a protocol, um, obviously in a moment when everybody's back, um, which they probably are, um, I'll introduce you, etc. But if you could have your microphone toggled off unless you are speaking, okay? And that does mean you've got to have the mental, the mental bit that you've got to sort of click on it when you do speak. Otherwise, you'll be talking and not saying anything. So if you look in the box um, where the hosts are, I can see sort of... Nikki's name, Rachel's name, etc. And so you can have your, your microphone toggled on or toggled off just there. You can see whether it is on or off. Okay. All right. So, um, in that case, if everybody is back, can we delay one moment? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Just Kate's asked me to stop for a moment. So we'll do that. Uh, while she's doing that, um, just given the time, I'll just go back. Are you going to put an image up? I'm not sure what's going on. Um, I'll just skip up here a little bit just to say within the slides there is the information about the census of Australian health libraries um, and Melanie Kammerman is the lead researcher for that. Um, and that's a picture of Melanie. Melanie lives in Hong Kong. Um, but still works very closely with HLA in her spare time. Melanie has been really very kind and created two videos for us. One is from last year, 
um, when the first iteration and the first video actually looks or takes us through what the census is all about. So a census being the idea that to gather information and data about health libraries, uh, health information services across Australia. So at that stage, she was only just collecting data. In the interim period, Mel has completed the, uh, the census, she's completed the analysis. And so the new video, the 2016 video, is a quick synopsis for you about the key findings uh, from the um, from the census. So at the beginning, she's finalizing the report. So we hope within a few weeks, we'll actually have the report available for you to read as well. OK, so please do that in your own time. And I'll stop there and let Kate take over to just introduce what she's doing. Well, and I just wanted to put up a quick picture that will show you what the microphones look like on and off, just to make sure everyone's OK um, with switching those microphones on and off during the panel. So I'm just uploading that image now for you. Won't be a second. So uh, the image at the top will show you what your microphone looks like when it's turned on. So it will be green. When it's turned off or muted, it's green with a line through it. So it's not as intuitive as it otherwise might be. It should be red, but it's not. So just to clarify, it's green when it's on, but it's also green when it's off, except that it has a flash through it. OK, if anyone has any problems, just shout out. Thank you. So are you putting ours back up again? Yes, great. Thank you very much. That's all good. OK, so there we go. Um, we can move on. Hopefully with no problems, and we've done that, we've been there. So, okay, we are in the panel session, and we've got 45 minutes. So, first of all, let me introduce our wonderful panel members. Um, Stephen Chang, he's librarian with Western Health Melbourne. Rachel Damaro is senior liaison librarian with Flinders University, with the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Services, Sciences, sorry. Nikki Foxley is with us from Queensland, and she's with the University of Queensland, based at the Hurston campus, and she is manager amongst the faculties of Medical and Biomedical Sciences and Health and Behavioural Sciences, which is a huge mouthful. Uh, Mary Grimmond is here again from last year. Rachel was with us last year as well, Mary, and, and she's with um, Mental Health Library, Macquarie Hospital, so quite a different field again. And we're delighted to have uh, Blair Kelly with us. He's a medical librarian with Deakin University in Geelong and was one of our participants last year in the course. So his career is going very well. Thank you very much. And Stephen is also undertaking the course with us as well. So we've got quite a range of um, experience and knowledge here. On the Blackboard site, there is a section which is Meet Our Guests with a little bit of a bio about everybody. So they're going to talk about themselves. So I'm not going to try and read the bios out because that will sort of pull the wind from under their sails, I think. Um, but there's a quick few photos. So Stephen, Rachel, Nikki, Mary, and Blair. So welcome on board. And the questions for the panel, um, they're going to sort of cover these topics. So basically around some insights into your careers, the different roles that you all play, um, considering the different client groups and the information needs, and very importantly, again, the skill sets that you do draw on. And we'll conclude with some little gems of advice that you might like to offer aspiring health librarians. So there's no set order um, at all, but um, let's so the first question, go with the order that I introduced you and ask, basically, what drove you to consider a career in medical and health sciences librarianship? Or indeed, how do you actually get into this field? What happened? So Stephen, can I, a couple of minutes there, what, tell us about how you entered the, this area. We can't hear you. I can't hear you. I think we've got a bit of a problem with Stephen's mic. 
microphone at the moment. Okay, while we sort that out, I might just move to Rachel. Could we um, ask you, please, to... <laughs> Hi, I'm Rachel. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. That's great. So, um, so I work in an academic library and um, I began as a general academic library trainee library chip. Flinders University offered these trainee positions. Um, uh, yeah, they haven't offered one for a while, but they used to have them. And we were, just, we were destined to be rotated across different divisions and get a, you know, a really wide range of experience in different roles. Um, and one of my rotations was to become the circulation supervisor at our nursing branch. And um, I just really enjoyed the health environment. So there, uh, an opportunity arose to apply for the nursing liaison librarian role. Um, and so I went for that. And that was Great. back on give away my age, it was back in early 2000, so, um, it was a, and that was an incredibly exciting time to be a health librarian because um, really the nursing and the medicine academics was just starting to get interested in the whole concept of evidence-based practice at that time and, um, and they, because they understood, you know, the central importance of um, clinicians and trainee clinicians mm -hmm. being able to find evidence, you know, effectively and efficiently. Um, we were invited to become part of their teaching team back then and um, quite, became quite embedded in the teaching process of evidence-based practice. So, so I moved into a research Great. position um, based entirely upon um, having those sort of skills, understanding the difference between research methodologies that came through evidence-based practice and, um, yeah, and that led to be what I'm currently doing. Great. So you, you certainly have been stimulated to stay in the sector and sort of, I presume it's actually continuing to grow and change and develop so that it's, it's a, a, a sort of dynamic career in its own right from that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's great. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. How's Stephen going? Can we see whether he is alive and well? Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you. Yep. Okay, that's all right. Okay, you are a little bit loud, but uh, so um, if you can just be a little bit back from your microphone, that'd be good. Um, so how did you okay. get into the field? Tell us. Tell us a little bit. Um, when I was doing my Masters of Information Management, uh, I did a subject called Health Informatics. Um, and I guess you could say it planted a bit of a seed in my head about health librarianship. Um, but I think the truth is that I did kind of just fall into health librarianship. Uh, you know, I'm really mm -hmm. glad that I did, but it is something that sort of happened by accident, I suppose. Ooh. Can you hear me properly? Yeah. Yes, I can. Yes, sorry, that was my, Kate was texting me about some problems okay. with the screen. So, yes, yeah, that was okay. Okay, so you're yeah, relatively yeah. new to the career, and so, as I say, you're actually participating as a student as well, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it all sort of maps out for you as well. That's great. Yep. Good. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Let's move on to Nikki. How about you? Give us a little few insights into how are you got to where you are today. Okay, just tell me if I shout. Did you hear me? No, you're not shouting at the moment. Yes, we can hear you and it's, yes, it's all fine. Okay, so yes. I, I didn't, um, I, I wasn't driven to consider a career in medical librarianship. I suppose I fell into it um, and so it was really also down to the window of opportunity that was avail to, available to me at the time. My husband and I were living in the UK mm -hmm. and I was looking for a job. I regularly checked the jobs insert in the Library Association Journal, which was the professional journal at the time, but I, I don't believe it is now. Um, that association's actually uh, merged and it's now part of a chartered institute. However, a librarian position in the Royal College of Nursing came up and I applied for it. I was interviewed and I got the job. And I worked there for about three years and truly enjoyed myself. But then we came back to Australia and for a wee short time I worked at the State Library of Victoria. And then I went overseas again for a very short time, came back and I applied for a job at the University of Queensland. And it was actually mm -hmm. a three months contract working with the School of Medicine 
on the newly developed graduate medical course. They had originally they had a, a traditional um, medical course, lecture based, but they changed it. Um, they totally turned it on its head and ch changed it into a problem based learning course or case based um, mm -hmm. sort of curriculum. And I worked mm -hmm. with them for three months, and then when the new and then actually right through the following year, and then when the new cohort of students came in, um, I became the librarian for that group. And I've since then moved around across the various um, health libraries at UQ, and I've never left. <laughs> yeah, again, it's a position that's growing and becoming more complex, I think, as, yeah. uh, as organizations change as well. So that's fantastic. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Mary, I'm sure your path has been quite different. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Can you hear that's me? great. Yes. Okay. Yes, very clearly. Thank um, you. Okay. Yes, so tell yeah. us your story. Um, my, my path was probably very different. I came uh, from a public library background. So, um, and really, just by luck, the, uh, there was a contract with the hospital here where I live, um, Oxford, where the lovely Suzanne Lewis is the manager. Mm -hmm. And I went there as a library technician and worked in a, an environment which I had no knowledge about and didn't even know really existed prior to arriving there. But when I worked with this group of um, they were so energetic and so enthusiastic and I had never seen anything like it. So um, after coming from a public library where you sort of were really kept, you know, if you had a role, that was a role and it didn't really change, um, you um, were given a chance to work and be involved in many different projects. Um, and part of that was um, evidence-based library practice. So we were really encouraged by Suzanne to understand that process by taking on projects ourselves. Um, so yes, that led to me then going on and doing my degree, taking on several secondments in different areas mm -hmm. and gra yes, gradually I guess getting my experience through many different opportunities to where I am now. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Yes, probably quite a different sort of route from a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a bit of a common thread that's coming through is that you, you get opportunities. It's, it's to have a very open mind about where your career might go and then to sort of not say no to, to something or to take the chance with short-term contracts which ultimately might grow into something quite different and, and, and sustainable as well. So that's really great. Good, thank you very much. And finally, Blair, yours was probably slightly different again. So you're, you only started in your current position in December, I think, so it's all still very fresh and new. So you tell us your story as well, please. OK, thanks, Jill. Um, so I, um, I, I did the library technician qualification initially. I saw that as a way to test the waters in, in libraries. It was um, a career change for me. I, during one of the, uh, the many moments I was bored in my previous career, I thought, oh, I really liked the library environment back when I was at uni and people work in libraries, so maybe I could be a person who works in a library as well. So I mm -hmm. thought I'd test the waters with the library technician qualification. I enjoyed that very much. Um, uh, pretty much immediately upon completing that through Swinburne in Melbourne, I m packed up and moved to Perth and um, was lucky enough to um, after a little while and doing various things, I um, got a position as a library officer, I believe, at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, in Fremantle. Okay. And um, I ended up staying there for six and a half years. And uh, again, uh, just sort of opportunities came up. And I kind of said, yep, I'll give that a go. And I sort of ended up doing a few different roles there um, before leaving to move back east in um, when was that? January 2014. So mm -hmm. moving back east is when I actually began, in, in January 2014 is when I began the uh, the health librarian thing. And that's when 
saw the position um, at Barwon Health in Geelong, um, and mm -hmm. I thought that looks really good. It's really different. It'd be a challenge for me. I kind of my my wife is a, a nurse and a midwife, and I'd already sort of always sort of scoffed at her, or like not not scoff, but um, <laughs> had a, had you know um, friendly banter. Let's put it that way about her working in health and the uh, the things she had to put up with with health. So I ended up finding myself in the world of health, um, not to the same degree as a nurse or midwife, but that was a little bit ironic. Anyway, I got to this um, this position at Bowen Health, and it was a it was a big big shift. Um, so previously, my experience had just been academic library. So coming into this health library, hospital library, special library, whatever you want to call it, was a big change. Um, but it was it was really fulfilling in a way. It was it was a very different kind of experience, and I found working with um, health clients, if I can put it like that, and working with the health literature was a very precise experience, very um, different to, to what I'd done before. Um, and I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, I was at Barwon Health for, for almost a couple of years, and um, just, just a few weeks shy of a couple of years, and then saw this position at Deakin University um, as medical librarian, and thought that would be a good a good step for me, a good um, good move to make. So I applied and was fortunate enough to be um, put into the position. So here we are. Excellent. Congratulations. So yeah, so so do you, I might sort of continue with you just because of that shift, if you like, between the hospital environment into the academic environment. So um, the, one of the, the the meaty bits that we want to try and explore in the panel discussion is really around the responsibilities. What sort of work activities do you have? Mm -hmm. So for you in that situation, has it changed dramatically between what you were doing in the hospital environment and now being an academic librarian? It it has changed. Um, it has changed a little bit. I've, I've, only, I've only been thinking a little bit, of, um, so I'm still you know working out how it all uh, goes. But the mm -hmm. I guess the key difference is um, working once again with uh, undergraduates um, as well as postgraduate students. But coming from the the hospital library, I'll refer to it as that, um, where everyone is an established. Most of the people I dealt with were established professionals. Um, I noticed the contrast coming from the coming from academic library into that in terms of. Yeah, I guess it's just the professionalism of the clients and, and what their expectations were, and then coming to my position now at Deakin, that's been a big shift. Um, mm, sure. There's probably more, at least with what in my just comparing my two experiences, there's more of a, a focus on the, at the hospital library of kind of solving the problem straight away. And, and one of the things I spent a lot of the time, a lot of my time at, at Bowen Health doing, was doing literature searching. So people would come to me, doctors or whoever would come and, and say, I need to do a search on this, I've got this query, and mm -hmm. I would do the search for them and, and return the search results and say, here you go, um, have a look through mm -hmm. that, and if you want to get full text, this is how you do it, or get back in touch with me and I can help you for it, um, help you find it. Whereas there's, I, I guess because of the, the scope, the scale of um, the university environment, there's not really that, that's not really what we do, we don't do... I don't do the searches for them. I would show them, hey, this is how you do a search, but I wouldn't do a search for them. So that's mm. been a big difference. Okay. Yep, great. And yeah, Suzanne, Suzanne has just commented there as well. Yes, if you want to look at the chat there, that hospital librarians provide very comprehensive, responsive service to clinicians, whereas students, it's more about empowering them to find information for themselves. That's a good synopsis, Suzanne. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you, Blair. What about you, Nikki? You've been in academic libraries for quite some time, um, so you're probably not at the cold face quite the same way that Blair might be. Um, what's, what are the responsibilities in your role? Um, I, I don't know if I agree. I, I actually agree with you about not being at the cold face. Um, so okay. Currently, with with my role, I I look after the two faculty. I, I oversee, I suppose, the, my team of librarians and senior librarians mm. are managing the two faculties. Um, our responsibility as a group extends across three different hospital libraries plus small, three very small um, collections in rural clinical schools. But the responsibility also extends to delivering a service to the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital, plus 
um, a virtual service to the Lady Salento Hospital. Right. So, um, so it's it's fairly far-reaching, actually. Um, mm -hmm. From the university, so the service we offer the hospital is not so different in a way to the service we offer the the university. Um, there are a few there are a few things that we offer the hospital that we don't offer the university in terms of literature searching. We certainly assist um, university clients in 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 undertaking literature searches, um, but we wouldn't do them for them. Whereas we do that with the hospital. Right. With the hospital, we have a special hospitals page, um, which identifies our services. Mm -hmm. And um, the promotion for the hospital side of things is done very much through um, the Hurston Health Sciences Library, which is the largest of the health libraries that I'm, a, I'm sort of responsible for looking after. Um, right. Uh, whereas from the university side, it's done through St. Lucia. Everything comes through St. Lucia, um, and which mm -hmm. is part of a, a very large um, group of people delivering a service, librarians delivering a service to university um, staff and students. Um, however, in the hospital, we have a lot of ac what we call academic, the academic title holders. Because our health students um, have clinical uh, undertake their clinical training in hospitals. Um, right. We give a lot of our hospital, those people who work in hospitals, the clinicians um, who work with our medical students and with our nursing students particularly, what we call academic titles. So they get um, access to UQ, all of the UQ resources. They are, they are like an, um, a staff member of the University of Queensland. Um, and right. so the sort of service they have, and there there are upwards of there there are more than three thousand of them, so they would receive the same same sort of how can I explain it services that we would give to the university uh, staff and students. Whereas our hospital staff use electronic resources, for example, from a specialised gateway, which is provided through Queensland right. Health. It's it's yeah. quite complex, yeah. but we yeah. do manage it. Um, <laughs> We manage, I manage it with my team, um, but from the day-to-day, -day, the day-to-day -day types of things are, um, you know, I contribute, for myself personally, I contribute to the library's strategic planning and policy development. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for, for, the, for my team, with my team, for developing and carrying out our annual action plan, and mm -hmm. uh, which is then developed from um, the learning and research services operational plan, which is the group that we actually sit under. Um, sure. I do all the, uh, the the sorts of normal things that a manager would manager would do in terms of participating in the formulation of budget and monitoring the expenditure. Um, mm -hmm. I have responsibility for my key my teams developing the collections. Um, I liaise with all the senior academic hospital research and other staff regarding the provision of services, whereas my senior librarians, I have three senior librarians who oversee the actual work of the liaison mm. librarians and the sorts of things they do. Um, I also have a small liaison responsibility to one of our institutes, the University of Queensland Centre for Clinical Research. So I do that basic liaison work that the liaison librarians mm. do as well. So I do a bit of everything. Um, you do. So You've got a very, very busy life. fulfilling <laughs> job and um, busy. That's great. Super. Great. Thank you. Thank you for providing all those insights. That's wonderful. Rachel, how about you? You're also in the academic environment. A similar sort of role or are you quite different? No, I'll take you are. Um, I work with a mm -hmm. team of health librarians too um, to, to support the wide range of health topics taught here. Um, but look, I'd say that I try to break this down and I think there's really three activities that we do uh, on a regular basis across our team and that I work with. Um, we, we really do, do a lot of lecture style teaching into, um, you know, we usually get given about an hour of a topic time to to talk about the quality of finding good research literature. We do a lot of work mm -hmm. around um, teaching 
not so much those technical database skills. Um, I'll get, to, I'll explain why uh, a bit further on. But really, we work a lot more now on how to conceptualise research topics, how to actually construct a search, um, and and a lot about re, um, managing results. Um, yeah, you, which usually means EndNote or saving searches to databases mm -hmm. and so forth. We do a lot of hands-on workshops, so we have some good teaching labs here with computers. So, mm -hmm. um, and they can be three hours with a lot of our groups um, and masses of one-on-one -on -one appointments with our academic staff and students. Right. And just to explain why it's a bit different, but we have a lot of our topics are postgraduate entry, so um, you know, and very high um, grade point average. Uh, entrance requirements such as medicine, or well, even you know speech mm -hmm. pathology, nutrition, very high to. Um, so we get a lot. A lot of our clients are very search savvy already. So we're not teaching those basic skills anymore. It seems we're really facilitators more than um, you know talking about the mechanics of searching. So what we would do, we we tend to have um, our one-on-one -on -one sessions can go from anywhere from one hour to three hours. But we facilitate so and collaborate so to create knowledge. Mm -hmm. I kind of it might be a fancy way of putting it, but um, mm -hmm. certainly you know these post grad students that come, they they're really more interested in the conceptual side to searching. If that makes sense, um, mm -hmm. so we mm -hmm. hope and prod yeah. and encourage them to think broader. You know, if they're only coming to us with one search term in mind, or or really to unpack mm -hmm. very complex. Um, topics, you know, like yesterday, um, I had a session with somebody looking at the social determinants of of suicide, and um, so you know, it, it takes you know the first Ooh, hour sometimes to then sort of trying to work with them to, to drill down a little bit further to to yeah. So um, certainly moved away from from when I worked with nursing students. You know, that's possibly different with nursing students. You're teaching them very basic um, fundamental skills um, to with our clients. Quite different, and a lot of systematic review searching techniques we now do, uh -huh, right. and, and and certainly principles of evidence-based practice. So it's either it seems to be one or the other. It's about finding evidence to answer a clinical query, or finding mm. anything available to in a comprehensive systematic review search. So, right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful to sort of get. That sort of um, that side of it there as well, um, Stephen. You are also involved in systematic reviews and things, are you? I think. If you want yeah. um, yep. So yep. in terms of so my role, um, yep. oh sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. Please go. That's fine. Oh, uh, so I guess in terms of responsibilities. Uh, formerly, I'm an assistant librarian, and on paper, my role is to, you know, support maintaining the library system, support training, and answering queries at the front desk. Very much a sort of entry-level type of position. But I guess one of the great things about working in hospital libraries is that you do get to bit uh, get to do a bit of everything, uh, or almost everything. Um, so now, uh, my major areas of work are now quite different from my on paper role. Um, mm -hmm. And like Rachel, maybe the best way to describe my responsibilities are dividing them into thirds. So one third of my work is essentially teaching and training, uh, designing and delivering classes, and hands-on workshops to train clinicians and researchers how to do really good literature searches, manage their references and research with EndNote, uh, showing them how to access clinical evidence fast or on mobile devices for clinical work mm -hmm. on the ward. Um, a second aspect, or and probably my favourite part of my work, is um, being involved in supporting our clinical librarian in uh, you know clinical outreach projects. Um, and these relate to evidence-based practice. And, and you know, helping to transform evidence into best uh, clinical practice. So, part of this involves both doing, supporting, and training people in systematic reviews, which is for those of you who don't know what a systematic review is, it's uh, an extremely systematic, almost kind of uh, a scientific way of doing a highly structured. 
uh, literature search that is very different from a, a standard literature uh, search. So those are really complex and exciting to teach and and do and collaborate with. Um, I've been invited onto um, research teams to be the uh, primary searcher for these systematic reviews. Um, as part of this supporting clinical librarian stuff, I also do critical appraisal, which basically means critically analyzing uh, clinical research methodology um, and rating the quality of evidence. Uh, mm -hmm. do custom literature searching, as uh, Blair mentioned earlier, and outreach into clinical areas, developing relationships uh, with uh, clinical leaders and researchers and so on. So that's uh, probably my favorite part, mm. the second aspect of my work. And the third area is, uh, you know, the su supportive uh, tasks like interlibrary loans, answering desk queries. I probably spend half mm -hmm. or more of each day on the desk. Um, so I guess the main thing I want to highlight with all of that is that everyone gets to do a bit of everything, even in an entry-level role. So, uh, yeah, a lot of mm. hospital libraries have small teams, but that means we get to pursue a really wide range of projects, and it's really exciting. It's a great, really great thing for um, people who are just wanting to start in health libraries. Indeed. Thank you. That's, that's excellent. Um, just to know that, I mean, there's just the intellectual difference between some of the work that you do, you know, um, that must be really quite challenging to sort of cover that whole ground. But meanwhile, in the chat box, everything's anticipating Mary. <laughs> uh, Suzanne was sort of stressing that Mary, as a solo librarian, obviously has to do it all and has many hats. So, Mary, would you like to take a couple of the hats off and tell us what's underneath them? Yes, um, so I am the library manager, but I am the librarian, library technician, library everything in my library. Mm -hmm. um, I manage the mental health library for Northern Sydney, um, so that means I actually um, have five other hospital sites that uh, have mental health um, you know, uh, departments, units at them as well, so I try to support them as well in collaboration with um, five other libraries across the district. Um, up mm -hmm. until recently that hadn't really occurred, but since I've been in the role I'm working much closer with them so that we can, um, that I can deliver a service that's, um, you know, for our users that, that's fair right across the whole area. Um, my role is very much a support role for our clinical and allied health staff. Um, we also support the students who are on campus at the time. Um, but I would say exactly what, like a few of the others have said, lit searches. At the moment, I'm, they're coming out of my ears. Um, but I do uh, training. You know, I uh, help uh, clinical staff uh, do their own lit searches. Um, um, help them with EndNote. Um, so I do that training one on one or in groups. Um, uh, I also, you know, uh, do the collection development for for my library service. Uh, I'm also in, ch you know, manage the library management system. At the moment, I'm working on a project to uh, merge that catalogue. So I've done all the work pretty much on my own with that. I manage the intranet site through SharePoint. Um, so I have a lot of hats and I think that's probably actually why I enjoy my job so much because I, although sometimes I wish I had another pair of hands, I, um, you know, I, I learned to juggle very well what's important and, and what I can put aside for a while. Um, and I, I do enjoy the variety. Um, it's, it's always a challenge, there's always something different. Um, you know, I, I go along to journal clubs with a few of the departments that I've been asked to attend those and I always find those very interesting and help them, you know, finding articles, etc. So, yeah, very diverse uh, range of, of duties that I do. 
Fantastic. That's really good. Yeah. I envy it. <laughs> a lot of them haven't got variety as well. Don't worry about that. <laughs> so, great. So thank you very much, all of you, to, to take that. Anne has just uh, sort of made a, a comment there in the chat box around flexibility and attitude being key. Then intellectual and technical skills are the basis, which really leads us directly into that question around the different types of skills that you feel are the most important in the role that you do play. Um, for those of you who've been in the field for a little bit longer, whether those skill sets have been changing um, over time, and then also what you can see um, the future requiring. Are there new skills, your professional development, that you think are going to be very important to make sure that you do move forward and don't get left behind? So it's quite a wide-ranging question. So we might start with a couple of the more experienced people. Uh, Rachel? What about you? Where do you fit with all of that? Sorry, I just cut out. I didn't hear the question. I just dropped. Oh. You didn't hear the question? No, dear. Okay. I will repeat the question. <laughs> can you hear us now, all right? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. So the, basically the question was around the skills that are important for the role that you do play. Um, and because you've been in your your career has, has gone for some period of time so so what are the currently you know uh, really important skills has that changed over time you know have sort of other skills sort of dropped to the wayside a little bit and other ones become more important but also looking to the future uh what you think you're going to need in terms of professional development to move forward as well yes certainly it's a big question it is a big mm. question indeed yeah look i would have to say at this moment in time um very high level searching skills um, are mm -hmm. incredibly important with the um, the advent of the systematic review, which seems to be um, mm -hmm. ubiquitous at the moment. So um, that's probably at the moment I would say they're the skills that I am most sought after for. Um, and certainly we seem to be heading into the area of knowledge translation. So I'm currently working on some knowledge translation projects in how to actually implement mm -hmm. research into um, into organisations and, and to actually make a change to practice. So I'm working with QUT on a project at the moment, actually. Um, so, I could. Yeah. <laughs> um, so definitely the, the high level search skills, because certainly I find that our, our users are not coming to us to find something. They are coming to us to make sure that they find a very specific thing, and that's and, and certainly to make sure that they haven't missed anything, which is quite a different way of, of looking at search. Mm. Um, they're really expecting us to find a needle in an incredibly large haystack, which is the biomedical literature. Mm. So being able to be very quite precise in your searching when it calls for precision, um, finding something, a few things amongst many, or, or going the other way and being able to, to adapt mm. your searching style to be able to be really comprehensive and broad, you know, on the Cochrane style of systematic mm. review searching. So being adaptable in your skills as well and understanding yeah. the context. Um, so oh, that would be interesting yes. and definitely being critical about your own searching skills. I know um, years ago, you know, I would never have questioned my own ability to find something as a librarian, but the more I've learnt about searching, the more I understand, mm. you know, that the underlying mechanisms and, and, and being up, being really critical and um, questioning what I might have picked. Um, certainly the other thing that is more to the fore now is really understanding the research methodologies. Like I can't stress enough how important that has been in my job, especially when you're presenting a client, a busy clinician. You know, these are incredibly busy people with, you know, a, a, a very large set of results and they are only really looking for the high mm. level evidence. Being able to say, you know, it's a systematic review or a randomised control trial is the best research mm. you have to suit your question and being able to hone in on that very rapidly is an incredible skill to have. Um, it's not one that mm. my colleagues outside of health really understand why we need to understand research methodologies. But um, look, I would have to say that's, that's really pivotal for us to be able to add value that mm. way. Um, can oh, no. also can I just say also that with the advent of the digital <laughs> era, um, I'm having to learn to use products such as Camtasia um, to create these digital mm. objects. There is a real push in the academic community to go online and make everything available, um, everything you're doing face to face, often available in parallel in an online way. So mm. that's definitely something new to me. I haven't had to worry about that before. So, and just mm. one last thing, I would. They, we are really, 
we there seems to be a push generally, I would say maybe I'm generalising, but towards being generalists rather than specialists in academic libraries. I don't know if my academic colleagues would agree with that. Um, and I would say in the health field, you need to be going the other way. I find that my my um, when I'm teaching, if I'm teaching a group of physiotherapists, they want examples from the physiotherapy literature. They want me to mm -hmm. tailor everything um, to them and closely align things with their research interests. Um, so definitely not a one size all fits, you know, one size fits all, all. Approach, which is incredibly labour intensive. I've got to say. So um, hmm. particularly around this time of year, we're having to adapt everything to. <laughs> To customise so the immediate context. Yeah. 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 So probably that would be the, the main. Oh, can I one more interpersonal skills. <laughs> I'm not going to steal thunder from anybody else, but can I sort of say being proactive and really anticipating the needs of your users and actually going out right. and speaking to them, I think, is incredibly important. Mm. It's those lift cool. and hallway conversations that can lead to really mm. interesting opportunities. In an organisation. Yeah. So again, it's that yeah, those relationship building to know that they can have trust in your skills to, to support them as they do. That's great. Thank you. That was that was really good com comprehensive coverage of that. Um, let me jump to Nikki then. How does that compare to your situation? Would you echo uh, Rachel's skill sets, or or do you find that you're using something different? Everything that Rachel has said, I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with. Um, but the yeah, um, I mean, we offer the the literature searching services to the ho to the, to the hospitals, and um, every, actually, everything she said is 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 absolutely yeah. what we do. But um, being also being able to learn new te new technologies on the run and being comfortable with that that. Which you hear a lot of lot, said a lot. The online environment, absolutely. Um, mm. Good communication skills in order to develop good working relationships and build partnerships with library clients. And these clients, they range. I mean, the hospital clients. We've got clinicians. We've got all the whole gamut of allied health professions, nurses, professionals, nurses and midwives, mm. researchers, academics. Don't think that um, there are no academics in a hospital. We have all these academic title holders. So. And, and they work mm -hmm. in the same way as the academics in the university with the research. With Queensland Health, Griffith, QT, UQ, all working together in big research facilities now. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's working with research, supporting re scholarly research support, basically, and bibliometrics. So these are the newer skills. Um, for some university library libraries, but UQ has been in in um, been working with scholarly publishing now for uh, mm. two or three years. But I know not all universities have. But um, uh, yeah, bibliometrics for grant writing, talking to. I, I think the other thing is communication skills. It's really really important, and. Um, being able, having the confidence, and being able to go out there and talk to people in their space, they, a hospital clinic, hospital staff can't necessarily come in to you, but you can go to them. We deliver um, small training in their space, in their units. We go out to them. We take our computers sure. to them. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's. That's just showing again that flexibility uh, that you need to be able to be able to do that. So, and again, the relationship. So, a lot of it is not necessarily the technical skills, um, as Anne pointed out earlier. It's, it's the personal skills, in terms of attitude and, as you say, communication and relationships. So that's fantastic. And there's lots of little comments coming through the chat there as well from some of the other panel members. So make sure that you check those out as we go. Thank you, Nikki. Um, let me jump to Blair very quickly then as well. Um, where we've only got about five minutes. So just um, what's different um, in your life? Any of the skill sets that haven't been covered yet? Um, no, look, I think it's... It, what everyone's already said is is, is um, very much my experience. Mm -hmm. One thing that um, <laughs> I find myself needing to improve on and, and using more and more is time management skills. Um, okay. Particularly, mm -hmm. I guess, at the hospital library, it was a very small team, and you work on something, but then you get interrupted by a client for particular needs or whatever. So, 
for me, having to get used to um, working in short bursts on one thing before being dragged onto another thing is, has been a big challenge for me, really. And um, it's, it seems to continue in the academic library as well. So that time management thing, um, teaching skills, mm -hmm. presentation skills, um, Rachel mentioned being proactive. Um, yeah, having familiarity with the resources, which is difficult to do until you're actually in sure. the position, but is obviously pretty crucial. Right. Um, and discipline yeah. knowledge as well. But yeah, every, I think it's really yep. what everyone said. Yeah, very multi pronged. It's certainly not uh, a straight line. Um, let me just jump to Stephen as well. Stephen, uh, any thoughts from you about? It's, again, you're sort of fairly new in the career. What about professional development? What do you see that you might need to sort of build skills in? You mean areas of skills to develop? Yes, yes, yes. Um, probably two that I'd like to highlight. Uh, people said it before, but again, re relationship building is probably the most important skill I use. Uh, health libraries are a small but really uh, important fish in a very big pond in a big organisation. So to float and survive, you need to build strong relationships. And that needs, I guess, to break that down, you need professional empathy, uh, negotiation skills, confidence, and self-awareness. Um, and maybe a concrete example is, um, uh, in terms of relationship building, I'm engaged in a major outreach project where the clinical librarian and I are trying to embed library and education into every ward in the hospital and in particular targeting the nurses who form the largest group of clinical staff. And they're also often the hardest to convince to engage in research and have the least amount of time. So you need to communicate really efficiently, state your case in their language, uh, be empathetic to their needs in terms of their, their context, their time, and their frame of reference. That means getting to work at 7.40 a.m., if that's when they're in service, is not not every day, but you know, that's something that I've done recently, mm. because you need to yeah. tailor everything to them and understand how they work. Um, another way to look at it is I've built a relationship with the Office of Research to do systematic review half-day workshops uh, in collaboration mm -hmm. with an epidemiologist. There's probably been one of the biggest challenges and biggest opportunities for the library in recent times, but it's hard work because there are barriers um, such as you know different expectations between the library and other departments, and so that's something that you have to navigate. Just quickly, uh, I think uh, I'd like to mention teaching and pedagogy. Um, mm -hmm. It's really important to design good teaching and learning experiences for clinicians. This is, and the reason I mentioned this is something that is it's something that I barely learned at all in library school. I learned it all on the job. Um, so it's really important for us to keep up with best practice and pedagogy, you know, problem based learning, collaborative learning yep. against the old models of didactic instruction which do have a long history in medical education. So mm -hmm. that's something that I would develop skills in if possible. Yeah. Very good. Fantastic. Yeah, and I agree with you totally on, on all of those fronts as well. So that's great. Mary, let's just come to you. Both. You're the last one on the skills. And then we'll just try and get like 25 words or less for uh, some advice for all of our participants. So just for, for you, what, what is your position, do you think? I, I think I agree with everything. I think everything has been covered. Um, Definitely the interpersonal skills and flexibility. You have to understand that everybody uh, is coming from a different place. In hospitals, there are still a lot of people who find the whole online environment, although it seems so natural to us, um, and how we deliver um, you know, results, etc. Um, there are still a lot of people who find that quite challenging. So having a flexible and uh, I guess empathetic approach to those people and, and meeting them where they are um, and understanding their needs, um, yep, you know, helps helps with all of those things. But I definitely agree with everything else that's been said. You know, I don't know if I've got too much more to add. <laughs> I think it's a very, very rich area and hopefully 
your words are sort of convincing the participants in the program that it is a really exciting career, uh, that there are so many avenues that you can per pursue and the, just bring so much variety into the, the job that you do um, have. So thank you all for that. So just, just to wrap up the panel session, um, how about uh, just a, a one sort of specific line of advice that you would like to give the participants as they sort of move into this field? Um, Nikki, what would you say? I, I, I listed down oh, horrible yeah. things, but I'm only going to say one. Uh, I yes, think. Only uh, one, <laughs> I think. I think. I, I think you need to develop. Well, if you start by developing a thorough understanding of evidence-based librarianship, finding, appraising, and applying best evidence in library decision making, you can then apply that to finding the best evidence in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Great. that's a good Thanks. start. Yes. Yes, so having that sort of appraisal and obviously in the program we're going to look at critical appraisal in module three and there are sort of some, some articles which are relating to librarianship as well as into the medical field as well, but the translatability of that across. I've just been involved in a systematic review of information literacy interventions, doing sort of the looking at face-to-face um, -face as opposed to online delivery and that was in conjunction with the University of Cardiff. And that was just a fascinating process to go through. And that was the first time I've actually been involved in systematic review work. So um, yes, it is translatable, the ability to sort of work across disciplines in that way. So that's yeah, great, thank I, you very much. Um, I, I, just, can hmm? I, I just think that people can um, identify easier with evidence-based librarianship than they can with mm. evidence-based health. So if you start from one and then take it to the other, I think they'll find it easier. Yes, yeah, that's, that's sort of the strategy that we put in place here as well. So that's really good, <laughs> thank you, that's great. Okay, um, Rachel, what advice would you offer our participants? Um, look, I'd have to say that I, I think we need to believe and understand that what we do does add value, like really believe in what we're doing. Um, I often, again, I often hear my non-health librarian colleagues say, you know, why doesn't anybody understand what we do and, you know, why don't they come to us? Well, that, I don't think that, that has never been my experience. People tend to get what we do and the value we add. So, and, and certainly I would say the best health librarians that I've worked with over the years haven't, review, haven't viewed themselves as sort of custodians or gatekeepers mm -hmm. to the information. Mm -hmm. Like really, they've seen themselves as collaborators in that creating knowledge um, aspect. So I'd say, you know, really you need to be intellectually curious um, and, and, and really believe that, um, you know, that searching is an imperative in healthcare. I can't think of another field where those skills are as important. Mm. So, you know, it not only changes practice, but, you know, it, it changes patients' lives and can actually shape health mm. policy and so forth. So I think, you know, it might sound a bit um, redundant, but, you know, really, believe in what you do, I would say, yeah. And, and look outside of perhaps libraries as well for those to offer those skills. So, um, you know, you can contribute to developing clinical practice guidelines, um, you know, systematic mm -hmm. views we've talked about, supporting research grant applications. We're now seeing librarians being hired within the university specifically to, um, to develop a grant application as well. Um, it's getting quite competitive. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, so yep. I think that's yep. a really important point. Okay, so yeah, be proactive and sort of yeah, look for the opportunities there as well. So fantastic. Thank you. Blair, you sort of agreed with Rachel there. What are, what else would you like to add? Um well, I agreed because Rachel kind of stole my thunder a little bit as well. But basically <laughs> what I was gonna say was um that one thing I really noticed was that um people at the hospital particularly it was evident people really valued what we did. They, the clinicians were often so, so grateful for the skills and the services that we provided. It was such a, uh, a benefit to them. And at, at the universities, the students are as well. It, it, even if it's not immediately apparent, they realise later it's, it's, it's a good thing that you're trying to teach them about. So yeah, as, as Rachel was saying, have confidence in your own value, in, um, in your abilities, and be willing to give things a go. So. 
I think Anne mentioned it back when I kind of dropped in on the chat here that attitude is um, is really a great key. So you don't know it, that's okay. We're librarians, we know how to find out about things. We go and track it down and, and yeah. you find out enough so that you do know and you can go back and, and go from there. Um, so right. leave in yourself and have a great attitude and give it a go and you can do it. Mm, I think that's excellent advice. Yeah, thank you very much. Stephen, have you got any uh, you, you, some words for everybody who's here? Yep. Um, you're, one, you're, you're one of the ones who are going to continue being here as well. So what would you say to yourself? <laughs> uh, the best advice I'd give to fellow newbies like myself is uh, network like crazy and get involved in your professional associations. Um, I've developed a lot in less than two years and that's because I've been doing these things. So even if it's something as simple as volunteering to do the microphones at a Health Libraries Inc. conference or write an evidence summary of an article for Health Libraries Australia News, um, mm. participate in the weekly hashtag MedLibs chat on Twitter each week, which is mainly American health librarians but very relevant to us and it's mm. at about one o'clock on every Friday. Um, if you've got the, so if you've got the time, volunteer for a committee, uh, get to know people, um, you'll learn so much. Yeah, learning from people is the best way to learn um, and it offers a safe place to try things, make mistakes, learn from them, things you may not learn in your day-to-day -day job. So get re really get involved in your pro professional association. Go to all the PD days that you can possibly attend. Um, that, that's super duper important, I reckon. Excellent. Yes, I think you bring some very good points to the table there. And dare I say, this course is a prime example of exactly that collegiate support and uh, the belief and sharing and um, sharing experiences and knowledge and things like that. So. That's really, really, really good. You hear so often that um, you know associations are dying, that you don't need them, and etc. But I think the health sector is very, very vibrant in many of those areas. So, and Stephen's got their Health Libraries Inc, Health Libraries Australia, of course, of everybody here. And finally, Mary, I think I haven't missed anybody out. I hope. Um, but so, any advice for? that hasn't been covered already? Uh, yes, I, um, well probably has been but I, I would just say exactly like Stephen, take on projects, jump in and ask if anybody needs help with something, you know, jump in and, and volunteer, um, stretch yourself and challenge yourself by doing these things. You will get so much out of it. You'll meet so many mm -hmm. people. Um, it's just a way of growing and a way of, of of really sort of stretching yourself and realizing, oh, I did, I know more than I thought, or you know, you, you by putting yourself out there, if secondments come up and you have opportunities to work in other roles, um, put your hand up, um, and hopefully you will have supportive colleagues and bosses who I had Suzanne. And I can't tell you how many opportunities I had because um, I would go to her and say, oh, I think I'd like to try that. And she would just say, I think you should. And off we'd go. So um, I think it's a great way of um, yeah, learning lots of skills and just giving yourself a, a chance. <laughs> Great, thank you, thank you very much. I don't disagree with any of those uh, bits of advice at all. I think um, everything that's there, there's so many aspects that you need to consider, but make it work for yourself. I suppose from the perspective of this course particularly uh, and the way we're running it, our belief is that you are going to learn from each other as well. So please make the most of the opportunity to get in touch with each other either by email or through Facebook or whatever it might be to sort of share because as so many as you can sort of see the pattern that's coming through different people have worked with different people at different times it is a network of, of professionals and so you're beginning to build your networks at this stage and you never quite know 
you know, when you're going to be working together as well. So explore all of those opportunities as well. I think in all of these sort of being proactive and thinking ahead, I think you've all voted with your feet already. The fact that you have um, enrolled in the course and are going this way, then um, you've you're already got that sort of uh, positive attitude. I don't think we'll have many people who, who don't believe in all of the advice that's been given by our panel members. So thank you panel members for your time, for your contribution and everything. Um, it's been really valuable, uh, a fantastic discussion and so many different perspectives from uh, people new to the profession and those who've been here forever and all the different times. Not ever, but you know what I mean. So thank you all. Just to wrap up then very quickly, we don't have time for any questions? We're, we're over time completely, but that's uh, hopefully everyone's still with us. Uh, any questions? please pop them to the Facebook site and we'll make sure that they reach the, the different people who you would like to address those things to. So finally, just the last minute then to wrap it all up, we've covered heaps, so much uh, in terms of not just the career side which has come through from the panel, um, but obviously then the, the policy, the background, the professional information uh, that's on the Blackboard site and that's quite well structured. For you to go there. Don't forget then that the, there's also the information about the census uh, from, from Mel. Uh, she's spent lots of time putting the videos together and I think the work that she's been doing on behalf of is funded through HLA, through a, um, a scholarship program, a grant program there. So it's giving back into the profession a deeper understanding about the profession itself. So that's really good. Um, and obviously, Suzanne, thank you very much again for setting the scene with all of your information about what clinicians do as well. So um, next class, hopefully you've uh, all enjoyed it and you're going to have some good takeaways. Um, we'll see you next week at 6 o'clock Brisbane time uh, and that will be Wednesday the 9th of March. So thank you to you all, everyone who's con contributed. Thank you for staying with us, all of the participants. And we'll see you next week and we'll have a, another exciting, rich program for you then. So take care, have a good evening, what's left of it, and see you next week.